Let there be light. Welcome to Holy Shit. This week we're talking about the top 10 killers in the Bible, the ones responsible for bringing about the most death. Indeed, there is an enormous amount of killing in the Bible. Yeah, and while we're pretty much all aware there's some death within its pages, I mean, if not most obviously because, spoiler alert, Jesus dies, well, sort of, how many of us are aware that the deaths of millions are depicted? And the ones responsible for these insane death tolls? Well, the names may surprise you. Now, in a book with a story spanning thousands of years, there's bound to be death. War has pervaded throughout human history, and it only makes sense that the Bible would bring it up. It's not as though it's the focus of the book or anything, except that through a lot of it, it is. And in spite of God's commandment not to plot to kill, war and conquest are nearly ceaseless in the Bible, all done in the name of God and faith, usually with God's explicit consent. But surely these passages glorifying the slaughters of entire nations haven't affected the peaceable Christians. Well, I'd be bearing the falsest witness imaginable if I said it hasn't. Dating back for as long as these scriptures have existed, there have been nearly countless travesties committed in its name. And if you know what kinds of stories it contains, that shouldn't come as a surprise. And this is not an ugliness unique to the Christian Bible. Jewish and Islamic teachings echo the same kinds of incitements towards holy war. So what are these stories of sacred slaughters hidden within its pages? Well, in a book filled with murder and divine assassinations, here's the top orchestrators of death, the Bible's top 10 killers. Number 10. The Pharaoh. Estimated 50,000 kills. Then Pharaoh commanded all of his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Exodus chapter once upon a time, before there was such a thing as Christians, Muslims, Nazis, Soviets, or Mel Gibson, the persecution of the Jews wasn't quite the cliché that it is today. So they wrote it into the scriptures, telling the story of how the Egyptians enslaved the Hebrews and how the Pharaoh ordered the death of all their firstborn babies because, well, he was afraid that having that many Jews in Egypt could hypothetically lead to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Egyptians one day as the Jews hypothetically fled Egypt. Unfortunately, in spite of his best efforts, the Pharaoh didn't kill quite enough babies. See, Moses happened to be among those dirty little firstborn Hebrew babies, and to prevent him from being drowned in the river, his parents stuck him in the river, in a basket, don't worry. And luckily for the fictional fate of the Jews, the Pharaoh's daughter found Moses before the crocodiles could and took him in, raising him as a son so that he one day could bring about the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Egyptians as the Jews fled Egypt. But, I still don't think he should have been killing all those babies. Number nine. Jephthah, estimated 62,001 kills. They said to him, then say Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Judges 12, verses six and seven. Jephthah, one of the Bible's biggest idiots, is also one of its biggest killers. To start, this son of a whore gets kicked out of the Gileadite tribe for being a son of a whore, but then they decide to invite him back so he can lead them to victory against the Ammonites by making a promise to God to kill his own daughter in exchange for the lives of what we could generally estimate as 20,000 people. Who wouldn't do that? Solid move, brah! His shenanigans don't end there either. He then gets pissed off at the Ephraimites, though I suspect he was really just mad at himself for killing his own daughter, and decides to go to war against them as well. But since the Ephraimites were also Israelites and it was hard to tell the two apart, Jephthah had the great idea to determine whether someone should be killed or not on whether or not they could correctly pronounce the word Shibboleth. Whether I kill you or not depends on just one thing. What is it? Tell me. How do you pronounce this word? Uh, uh, can, can, can you read this? What? You you can read this. Yeah, yeah of course. It just looked like squiggly lines to me. Uh, it's ancient Hebrew. Oh, oh yeah, what does it say? Uh, Shibboleth. Oh yeah, Shibboleth, yeah. Yeah, I'm really dyslexic, man. Yeah, but you can't kill me now, right? Because I read it? What? Oh, shit. Well, rules are rules, right? Say it again. Shibbo... Shibbo... Shibola? Shit? Shit. About 42,000 could not. Number 8. Esther and Mordecai. 
75,813 kills, and Esther said, If it please the king, let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. Esther chapter 9, verse 13. Esther and Mordecai, a.k.a. the gruesome twosome, that's my name for them, are two spiteful Jews in the Old Testament that consistently managed to convince the king to kill anyone in remote opposition to the Jews. Where were these guys during World War II? <laughs> See, after having sex with the king for months and months as a prostitute, Esther is made to be queen, just as her father-in-law Mordecai discovers a plot to kill the king. So Esther orders the plotters to be hanged, and thus Esther and Mordecai's thirst for blood was awakened. The next victim was one of the king's officials, Haman, who thought it would be a good idea to kill all the Jews and erect 60-foot-high gallows. Well, Esther and Mordecai, these script flippers say, fuck that, and convince the king to hang Haman instead. From there, things get a little out of hand, as Esther orders by Mordecai's insistence that all the Jew haters they could find be killed, which ends up being a lot of people. Since then, in honor of this wonderful day of gladness when over 75,000 people were killed, the Jewish people celebrate Purim without fail every 14th and 15th of Adar. <laughs> well, heck, happy Purim, everyone! Number 7 Gideon, 120,002 kills. And Gideon arose and killed Zeba and Zalmunna, and he took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. Judges chapter 8 verse 21. Gideon, one of the judges of the Israelites told of in the book of Judges, has a name meaning destroyer, mighty warrior, and feller of trees, which is accurate, I guess, because he's credited with over 120,000 killings in the Bible. In fact, Gideon and God agreed that Gideon was so goddamn good at killing that he actually had way too big of an army to take on the Midianites, who apparently in only six or seven generations went from being utterly decimated to a locust-like abundance. Bunch of damn rabbits, those Midianites. No wonder God wanted generation after generation of Hebrews to exterminate them. Plague of locusts, more like plague of the Midianites, am I right, God? Yep! <laughs> So Gideon decides to whittle his army of 32,000 down to only 300, ultimately only deciding to take the men who, when prompted to drink out of the river, drink using their hands. These fine men who drink straight from the rivers, asses high in the air, these are the men that shall lead us to victory. Welcome to the squad. And then they go kill 120,000 people by blowing a bunch of trumpets, which actually just causes most of the Midianites to kill each other in confusion. Trumpets are confusing, but two of those pesky kings don't fall for the magic trumpet trick, so Gideon just goes and kills those guys himself. In the name of the Lord. Speaking of which... Number 6 The Angel of the Lord 185,000 kills And that night the Angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35. You know, the funny thing about angels is sometimes they just kill 185,000 people in their sleep one night. Oh, those little angels. There's something a little weird about this passage, too, besides the magical creature killing 185,000 people in their sleep one night. It's that it says, when they woke up in the morning, they were all dead bodies. But if they both woke up and were dead, doesn't that mean... I'm just saying, this sounds like zombies again. Number 5. Moses. Estimated 269,002 kills. Moses said to them, Now therefore kill every male among the little ones, and kill every woman who has known man by lying with him. But all the young girls who have not known man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. Numbers chapter 31, verses 15 through 18. My God. God, that is vicious! Jesus Christ, that is vicious! This is Moses, ladies and gentlemen, and this is only number five! What happened to all that rage against the Pharaoh for killing all the babies earlier? How dare you kill babies, Pharaoh! Kill the babies. Yeah, kill all the women and children too, except for the virgins, keep them for yourselves. Yeah, Moses is one sick fuck. And he's not afraid to get his hands dirty either. In Exodus 2, he straight up murders an Egyptian for beating a Hebrew and buries him in the sand. Of course, as can frequently be established with Moses, he was a complete hypocrite. Because after leading the Hebrews out of Egypt, he has no problem picking off his own people either. Some guy uses the Lord's name in vain in Leviticus 24 and Moses orders the whole congregation to stone him to death. 
Of course, that's nothing compared to Moses' reaction to Aaron and the gang crafting themselves a golden calf to worship. Moses flips the fuck out like a psycho, burns the golden calf down to a powder, sprinkles it in the water, and forces people to drink it. Drink it! Drink it! What is it? Just drink it! <laughs> Tastes terrible. Does it taste like gold, boy? <laughs> No, it's some sort of metal. It tastes awful. <laughs> That's because you're drinking your beloved golden calf. <laughs> so fuck you. <laughs> yeah, then he orders the death of 3,000 of his own people. Besides all that, Moses racks up his massive kill count by leading the Hebrews into numerous holy wars, including one where he kind of pulls a magic trick and kills all the people of Amalek by keeping his staff elevated in the air. Yeah, for some reason, God left the fate of a battle up to how long Moses could hold a stick in the air. <laughs> all right, look at this. What a glorious battle. Woo! All right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Moses. Look what, at us! What, what, what? You're getting us killed when you lower that. Oh, the battle! Yes, the battle. keep it up, mm -hmm. man. And I gotta, I gotta hold this up. Yep. Come mm -hmm. on! All right, all right. All right. Here coming we go. Back. Momentous coming, coming back. back. Here we go. A lot of killing going on. Oh yeah. Oh, what? Now they're on the other side. No, no, whoa, no, whoa, 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 whoa. Come Moses, on, man. Whoa, Moses. Whoa, you know I, I, I gotta keep hold this up really high, and I'm trying to sleep. Okay, I'm tired. I got, I want to catch some Z's. You want to do it? No. You want to do it, Aaron? Yeah, I bet you'd love to do it. You have terrible arm strength. You want to try? You want to trade her? No, you don't. So watch the battle. Number four. Joshua estimated 322,036 kills, and they struck them until he left none remaining. And Joshua did to them just as the Lord said to him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. Joshua chapter 11, verses 8 and 9. One of the finest warriors and spies in Moses' army is Joshua who keeps the holy wars going with a fever in the book of Joshua, carrying out hundreds of thousands of his hundreds of thousands of kills as commander. Unlike many of the other militant Hebrews in the Bible, though, Joshua was never one to shy away from directly assassinating people. He personally executes 31 different kings by sword, briefly hangs their bodies from trees to show off his murders, and then hides the bodies in caves. You know, like a reckless, insane serial killer. And if you think Joshua stopped at just the kings, then you missed the number 322,036 underneath Joshua's name earlier. He also orders the death of every man, woman, child, and infant in all of the kingdoms belonging to these kings, leaving no one alive, burning the cities to the ground. Had Joshua really existed and done all of these things, then through executions of kings, innocents, and his own people, he would have killed nearly 1% of the earth's population at the time in his continuous holy wars of conquest, all stamped with God's consent, advice, and approval. Yeah, God spoke directly to Joshua, not to any of us, of course, but that genocide guy, he talked to God all the time. And speaking of genocide and holy wars, not surprisingly, Joshua is venerated in the Christian, Jewish, and Muslim faiths. Number three. David, estimated 370,124 kills. Before the time had expired, David arose and went, along with his men, and killed 200 of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins, which were given in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 26 and 27. David, 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 you fucking murderer. David, who becomes King David, is the character in the Bible with the most coverage other than Jesus. Unlike Jesus, though, David is totally obsessed with penis skin. Yeah, you want to know how many dead guys' penis skins David snipped off and kept? Well, at least 200, I'll tell you that. Which means there would have been a guy walking around holding a bag holding 200 penis skins. I said there would be a guy walking around with a bag holding 200 penis skins. Chris Shea Kirk? Chris Shea Kirk? I'm not doing this one. How about you do the goddamn skit? Look at my bag of penis skins. Ha! Good. Anyways, the reason for this is because throughout the first Samuel, David has this petty rivalry with King Saul, who's pretty much constantly trying to kill him like Wiley e. Coyote and the Roadrunner, always trying to throw his spear at him or ambush him in the wilderness. Going back to the penis skin thing again, Saul's the one who asks David to bring him 200 Philistine foreskins so he may marry his daughter. Okay, weirdo. Really, the ultimate reason King Saul hates David, though, is because of jealousy. The women in town make fun of Saul by singing about how Saul only killed thousands of people while David killed tens of thousands of people. 
That's right, kids. Girls will tease you unless you kill tens of thousands of people, would be the message here. And also, cut off your foreskin already, for God's sake! Literally, it's for God's sake. So yeah, David's a pretty big piece of shit, just like Moses and Joshua. He kills a bunch of his own people while living amongst the Philistines, carrying out raids for the Philistine king. At one point, he dismembers some of his execution victims and hangs their bodies by a poolside. He even has sex with some guy's wife, gets her pregnant, and then sets her husband up to be killed in the front line of battle. Not even God was cool with that one. But believe it or not, when it comes to sheer body count, there's a bigger piece of shit yet than any of these Bible heroes. Number two. Asa. One million kills. Zerah the Ethiopian came out against them with an army of a million men and three hundred chariots. Asa and the people who were with him pursued them as far as Gerar, and the Ethiopians fell until none remained alive. Second Chronicles chapter 14 verses 9 and 13. Really? One million Ethiopians? There were only about 50 million people on earth at this time. That's two percent of the world's population. Are you kidding me? 2% of the Earth's population, 1 million people. First of all, how did Ethiopia amass an army equivalent to 2% of the world's population? And second of all, were this actually an historical event? I don't think it is. It would rank by many accounts as the second worst genocide in history. And relative to the world's population at the time, it's even worse than the Jewish Holocaust. Not only that, but it would rank twice as bad as even the highest estimate for the death toll in Ethiopia's worst genocide in history, the Red Terror. In other words, the Bible claims God helped the Jews commit the worst genocide in history against the Ethiopian population of Africa, effectively leading to twice as large a percentage of African deaths in the world as even the slave trade relative to the world population at the time. God must hate black people more than George Bush does, or at least not give a shit about them compared to the Jews. All the Jews had to do was ask, and God was willing to help them racially cleanse the area and wipe out one million people. Is that all any of these genocide guys had to do was just ask? For that matter, if this were true, remind me, what's so likable about this God? Number one. God estimated 24,994,828 kills. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. God damn it. The number one orchestrator of death in the Bible, the number one killer by far, far and away, is God himself. And I don't mean incidental kills. God is intentionally killing people and specifically pointing out that women, children, and infants need to be killed as well. Also a lot of animals, but we don't even have time to get into that. God wrecks entire cities, kills off races of people, floods the fucking earth, all but decimating all life on the planet. It's completely insane how much killing this God does. We consider the Pharaoh in Exodus to be such a villain and rightfully so, but he's 10th down on the list in terms of kills. Why did the authors make the hero characters of God and Moses responsible for killing even more people than the villain? We relate with Moses at first and detest the Pharaoh because the Pharaoh is a baby killer. But what do God and Moses do in return? They kill more babies. It's evil. And speaking of evil, the apparently most evil dude in the Bible, Satan himself, only kills 10 people in the entire Bible. God kills tens of millions. And Satan only kills 10 people because God tells him to go ahead and do it. So you could include Satan's 10 as part of God's tens of millions as well. To this day, the types of holy wars incited by God in the Bible continue to plague the planet. Conquest and genocide over religious beliefs have never let up since these scriptures were written, particularly in the regions described in the Bible. For thousands of years, idiots! killing millions of people, families, children, lovers, dreamers, inventors over fiction. These war stories in the Bible are not historical. They are man puffing his chest out. It's a dog barking, a bird poofing out its feathers, a snake rattling its tail. It's the ancient Hebrews saying, hey everybody, we're some bad motherfuckers. Leave us alone or our God will kill you. But today, thousands of years later, the Jewish people do not need these stories anymore. Nor do the Christians or Muslims or anyone. Because real war stories are happening today. The real war stories for us to learn from are happening right now, just outside. 
and the victories of today are not resolutions of war arrived at by further killing and indoctrination, but by further peace and acceptance. That is how you will empower a people. Put down the bullshit and talk about some real shit. And that's it. That just burns me out, man. I don't like talking about this much killing. Okay? You know, what am I? I'm a priest here, okay? Priests aren't all about killing. The Bible isn't supposed to be all about killing. Why is there so much killing? Okay? I just don't know if I can handle this life as a priest. I just need to... I just need to relax right now and have a beer and, you know, be amongst other priests and just... You know, keep the collared life in perspective. That's our list, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for watching. Hey, priest. Hey, priest. Uh, look at us, a couple of priests. You know, did you ever think when you were starting out that being a priest would involve this much killing? I, I just never thought religion involved this much killing. Uh, I did. You did? Oh, because kill a priest. Kill him. Nope. Not kill a priest. It's kill la. Okay. So when you were back in seminary school, you know, did... You know I'm not a real priest, right? Oh, okay. Well, me neither. I mean, I filled out the thing online, but I, I didn't follow through, so I don't think it... Online? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a website you can get ordained online now. It's great. What? Well, I gotta check that out. Yeah, yeah, no, man, definitely. There's, uh, there's lots of uh, famous people that, that have done it. Uh, Johnny Carson, Brian Cranston, um, also Rob Deerdick, Kathy Griffin. Rob Deerdick and Kathy Griffin. I gotta check that out. Standing on the shoulders of the galaxies, looking at a new reality above the earth, believe God's balcony through the universe, through the eyes of a storm and the falls of an odyssey. Shooting torpedoes at the evil from the wheel of a seagull. With the wings of an eagle, I come to heal the people. Snatch the seal and reveal the Hebrews. Never our birthday, dear Christmas. Food for thought out of satellite dishes. I snatch out your bio chip, rearrange your manuscript, make you into a brand new kid. A secret life of Daniel Smith. A robot that I throw in a box. Put codes in his clock. Your head is blow with a flow of top. Hey, priest. <laughs> okay, one more time, one more time. <laughs> <laughs> Body of